thanks to all of you, Fishing the DMV not only hit our goal of 100 Patreon subscribers, we blew way past it. I just want to say, guys, thank you so much for believing in this channel and helping us hit this major milestone. I want to talk to you about future plans. Our overall goal with this channel and our, and our big picture dream is to create a nonprofit that's really run by the people. The nonprofit's going to be focusing on supplemental stocking of our local waterways. We're going to also do boat ramp restoration and facility restoration. There's a lot of boat ramps on the Shenandoah, the Ever Potomac, the James, everywhere that just need a little bit of love and some TLC. We also want to do habitat cleanup days, youth programs, and just so much more. And what's great, a lot of these things will be voted on by the people of what we need to hit next. Now, are we going to be able to change the world with this nonprofit? No, but we can start making a difference in our local community. Now, to run a nonprofit, there's a lot of work, a lot of moving parts. So instead of having to go right off the gate and go door to door for companies looking for donations, we're going to make sure that when this thing gets started, it's homegrown. So what we're looking for is 600 Patreon supporters. When we hit 600 Patreon supporters, that could be tomorrow. That could be in two years. It doesn't matter because I'll be here that whole time. But when we hit 600 Patreon supporters, we're going to be filing for our 501c3 to get this thing up and running. And we can then go into more details each and every week on the show about what's in store and all the wonderful good that we can do in this fishing community. If you would like to become a Patreon supporter and you want to join us on this journey, please feel free to check out the link in the episode description. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all of their orders to Tiger Crankbaits. They'll gain access to our private Facebook group community page where we have weekly prize giveaways and online tournaments and picture contests. And you'll also get private content from me, like the Doc Talk series, where I'll be going through kind of like what I did fishing wise that week. If you are interested in helping us eventually hit this goal of having a nonprofit that's really for the people of this great area, please check it out. Thank you so much. Fishing the DMV is the number one fishing show in our region, reaching thousands upon thousands of avid anglers and outdoor enthusiasts each and every week. As the show continues to grow, we are now actively looking for a company who would be interested in becoming the presenting partner of Fishing the DMV. If you are looking to promote your company to a highly engaged audience, passionate about fishing, outdoor adventures, and conservation efforts in the Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania area, please email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Again, if you're a company interested in joining and becoming a part of the number one fishing show that continues to grow in leaps and bounds each and every month, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have, we're going back into the crappie world. Um, every year I try to add to just the repertoire of what we do in the DMV. You know, it's not just about largemouth fishing. I'm getting into the striped bass and the red fishery that's booming in the Chesapeake. And I really had the, the great honor at the Richmond Fishing Expo to get hooked up with the, uh, you know, the Richmond Crappie Club. And we have the first Derby of the year. And we have these two nice, fine gentlemen on the show, uh, James and John, who won the first Derby on the Chickahominy River. And you guys won with 10 pounds and 88 ounces, which is an absolutely insane bag. Guys, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. No thank you. So, I mean, really before we get into the tournament, I, I'm, I'm a newbie to the crappie world. I, I, I have my thoughts on it, especially from a bass fishing perspective. I feel like you guys are way ahead of the curve when it comes to using the sonar and and really how to snipe fish. I mean, look at the trolling motors that you put on power poles now. That's 100% coming from the crappie world. Um, so, to take a step back, like, how did you guys get into the crappie fishing world? I started out, I live up on Lake Anna. And before I bought my first, you know, fishing boat, I would fish around the docks and might have been 2020, maybe 2021. I caught a, a citation just fishing off of the docks. Citation crappy. I had caught probably 50 that day just standing on the docks. And once I caught that citation, I was hooked and then went out, bought a, a it was a panfish 16, so a stick steer boat. And we fished out of that for the first two seasons. Wow. 
uh, out of that. But it didn't it didn't quite fit the style that we wanted to fish. So we changed boats. So. Mm. What did you get into then? Uh, the boat was uh, a Tracker 190TX. Oh, that's an upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. Did, yeah, so did, a whole lot more room. Plus, with sniping fish, we're, we're using anywhere from 15 to 17 foot poles most of the time. That's insane. You know, that way you don't sneak up and spook the fish. You see them on your sonar. And, you know, say if they're 20 feet out, you drop your jig on down, you can watch it and then just float right on up to it. Uh, how, but with the panfish, you couldn't you couldn't do that. The boat wasn't set up that way. How do you get in? Like, it seems like such a niche technique when you're using those massive cane poles. Did you guys just do you had mentors that got you into this? Did you just learn this on your own? Like, how did you get all this tackle and stuff? Because it's not something that seems like it's readily available at like a Bass Pro Shop. The uh, the the long pole and fish and stuff. Uh, Josh, that was on your podcast last time. Uh, took me out last year and kind of showed me that. And that was a new technique to where um, that I, I really didn't play around with until he took me out. Once he took me out, I went and bought one. I think we caught 22 fish that day down on the James River. And I went out and bought one and, and started playing around some little farm ponds out in Powhatan where I live and just started getting it down and down and down, just working on it with the forward facing sonar. So. But it's it's a it's it's a it's a learning curve to doing that and the forward facing. So it is. That's that's for sure. How long was it like? How do you guys feel about forward facing sonar in the sense of do you feel like you're pretty proficient at it? Because you, if I'm not mistaken, you've been only been doing it for this about three years. Uh, I would say we're pretty proficient at it. Um, We've only been running forward facing sonar since yeah about a year and a half oh wow so um i'm 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 really good with the the technology the fish finders side scans down scans all that good stuff and it's just a, an additive to it um and just learning it once you learn it it's pretty pretty straightforward so what are you specifically running on on your tournament setup right now is it just are you lawrence hummingbird garmin because i know all uh, three Lawrence, we have uh, two FS9s on the boat, one at the console, one at the bow, and then we have an HDS-12 at the bow as well. And that's normally what we run the forward-facing sonar off of. It's that one. And on the display above it, the FS9, we normally have the map on it. That way we can watch contours of creek channels or, you know, you're, you can see your waypoints that you've already gone through and marked on your side scan when you're, when you're pre-fishing. But that's that way insane. you can keep the map up and, you know, follow right along the the creek channels or the river channel or whatever you're fishing. You don't have to keep switching screens back and forth. That's so cool that so much of this does actually mirror like the bass fishing world as well. Um, when you came into the Chickahominy event, how much experience did you guys have on this body of water? Um, we fished it we, we did years, but just off and on we've never really done good with uh with uh, the james river or chickahominy river because it's a tidal river um so the the tide going in tide going out and slack tide is it's really it's really difficult to learn so but we've we've been trying to to learn those pretty good and between this tournament and the one in december for another uh another guy uh, we ended up winning both of them. So I think we're wow. getting pretty good at the tidal rivers, hopefully. <laughs> but we did fish the Chickahominy River quite a bit in December. Mm -hmm. um, we went out two weekends in a row, double limit of fish. Uh, you know, both both back-to-back -back weekends. I think we had, I, we were throwing, away, throwing back pound and a quarter fish Whew. because we had 50 in the live well. Um, we finished third in the tournament there, um, in December Wow. on the Chickahominy River, one that Chickahominy crappy put on. And then we fished another title tournament down on James River with James River Tackle Company, won that one. And then that was in December as well. And then, you know, February back on Chickahominy. So we're starting to learn the title rivers pretty well. How but much the did the crew a lot between December and February? 
And yeah, and that kind of leads me to my first question is like, how much do the crappie in, in winter tidal situations move compared to bass? Is it pretty much the fish you found in December? And you don't have to give up all your spots, but I just meant fish behavior. Do they do they move a lot? Or are they pretty much locked in from December to, till now? No, they move, they move they a move lot. a lot. Wow, a whole lot. We checked. Uh, we went to the chick. Um, what is it? The week prior to the tournament, and fished a few of our waypoints where we caught a lot of fish before, and I think we ended up catching four or five fish. Um, the day before the tournament, we pre-fished and we found some decent fish, and we started fishing them, uh, and we figured that's probably where we would start. And then when the tournament started that Saturday, we went up river and there's already six, six or seven, eight boats already sitting in those areas. I, I think we ended up with 11 boats out of our tournament. We're all within 500 yards yeah. of each other. Wow. So we knew everybody, everybody was fishing the same crappy. So does that goal, push them off at all? Like how does that boat pressure oh, affect yeah. them? I don't think it affects them very much at all. No, especially that weekend. No, because they weren't on any kind of structure, so you're not running them off of the structure or anything like that when you're when you're fishing them. The all the fish that we caught in the tournament were all single open, you know, open water roaming fish. How does I don't think for a lot of people, especially the ones that don't have forward fishing sonar, understand this. And I think uh, I will butcher this guy's name, Fujita, whoever it was. Uh, and I apologize uh, to my Japanese audience who did well just the last week on the Bassmasters, when you're targeting an individual fish roaming around, are, are, are you leading him? Like, how does that whole stalking process work? I know it's a little off, uh, off the tangent here, but I'm curious about that. Um, well, down on the Chick River uh, where we were fishing, uh, again, it was just, it was just a, a ton of fish. Um, so there wasn't really too much stalking. Uh, the next couple tournaments coming up, we'll probably have to do a little bit more stocking, but, um, it was just, it was just the number of fish and with the amount of boats that were fishing in the same area. Uh, it was, it was all, all about who could put the most fish in the boat and upgrade their bag. So, and so we ended up with 44 in the live well after the tournament and we threw back probably a good 25 that were definitely over a pound. Damn. I want to get back to the stalking thing eventually because I think that's fascinating, that, that technique <laughs> style. But when you're dealing with that, when you're cycling through fish, what made you want to stay and just hope that you were going to get the bigger ones? Because I think even in bass fishing or any other thing, that's the thing. It's like, do you stay and call through or do you look for that other caliber? So, so come tournament, being that there were so many boats in that same area and knowing the guys that we fished with, they had done their homework ahead of time as well. So all uh, pre-fishing, we went all the way from Walker's Dam all the way to Route 5 on the Chickahominy. It's, in, in my boat, it's probably a good 25, 30-minute run. You know, so we checked pretty much everywhere between Walker's Dam and Route 5, and that was the best class of fish that we saw uh, wow. pre-fishing. Our best seven pre-fishing the day before went just under 10 pounds. I think we were at 9.98 or 9.99. So I knew that we would have something to work with, um, you know, if we spent all, the whole tournament time right there in that same area. That takes guts, though, because so many people complain about dealing with other boats that they see. Is that just something that you guys just blocked out of your mind? Did that stress you out at all, seeing people just like this big, just going around in a circle type of deal? <laughs> so so come tournament day, we we do things – you know, a lot of people are like, oh, we're going to put two people up front and, you know, we're going to you only have one forward facing sonar. So it gets kind of hard when you're trying to drop two baits down and who's going to net the fish, who's going to call the fish. Yeah. So I sit in the back a lot of times and I had four poles just hanging out. Uh, some of them had minnows on it. Some of them had jigs on it. Just had them just sitting there passively. I was watching on the on the rear display and could see when he would catch a fish he wouldn't even have to say a word and i would be standing up grabbing the net net the fish i would take it you know i would do everything with the fish he's still hunting on the forward facing sonar while i'm doing all the other stuff get his jig back on correctly he's back fishing and then i'm sitting here culling and live well management and all that stuff 
That's actually pretty smart. I, I, that's a really interesting strategy. Yeah, have one yeah, person because, sniping. You know, yeah. You've got one person that's always got his eyes on the screen looking for the next fish. And Do you say if he, break, if he breaks off or something, another yeah. pole right there while he's still sniping, I'll tie something else on. That way we, you know, another bullet in the chamber, have you ready to go. Yeah. Do you have all of your rigs set to the same depth or do you have them at various depths? They're, when when I'm sniping on, on the front of the boat, uh, actually, I, I have a little bait caster on my 17-foot machine and it I can drop it fast. I can raise it up fast, reel it up a little bit. Um, I like to hold the line just out on my in my left hand while I'm sniping with my with my right. That way I can raise and lower the jig real quick. Uh, if they're up higher in the water column, I can pull it up some. If they're low, I can drop it down some, lower the tip. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult and fun at the same time. So it, It's just the rod management's insane that you guys put up with. I think if I have two or three rods on the deck, it, it gets crazy. And you guys just have an armada out there like, do, do you not get yeah. tangles and stuff like you have to deal with every once in a while but not not that often we've been fishing together for so long that you know we we know when it's going to tangle just by the other person's body language you know it's you know a bad drop or something you both get hung up in the same area uh but that's another reason why i step to the back a lot of times during tournament day that way it takes that part out of the equation yeah yeah dropping two lures at the same place and uh, getting, getting tangled up and the ones i'm running off of the the back i have them set off to the sides i was i think i was running two 12 foot rods and two 10 foot rods hmm. and i was I had, each one of them had double rigs on it but it was some one of them had like a jig and a minnow on you know one one of them was double minnow you know and i had them at varying depths and we actually caught three of our tournament fish passively back there that's insane um, like you know, wow. three of them that we ended up in our in our tournament bag just came from the pole just sitting out. You said you had to cover, you had to call through a lot of fish. Did you ever have a moment where you thought you had a chance? Yeah. As soon as we hit 10 pounds, I knew we had a chance. And I'm going to say in the first hour from back there, you know, Cullen, our first seven fish weighed 834. Okay, so, so the first hour, we, yeah. You know, whenever you can put together eight, you know, over eight pounds through seven fish without culling a single fish, then, you know, you, you've definitely got some room for improvements. We had another, what, six hours of the tournament left to where we could just sit there and just keep culling and culling and culling. I think that's really, that's interesting because it sound, I thir at first I thought it, it took you a while to actually amass the weight, but it sounds like you got set up pretty early in the day. And, and since... You were sitting pretty early. Did you change? Did mentally did it change at all? Like what your strategy was going to be? Okay, you're sitting around eight, nine. You got six hours left. Let's swing for the fence a little bit more. Or are you going to be like, now let's just be conservative and keep doing what we're going to do? We just kept doing what we were doing. The fish kept biting. We kept doing. <laughs> we just yeah. kept pulling them in. So, um, what, the only things that we really did change uh, during the tournament, I think it was like the first hour. Uh, we you made a color change. Yeah, we made a couple color changes on on our baits, uh, and then at a certain point, I could tell that the ones I was trying to snipe just kind of wouldn't bite anymore. So we had, like I said, we have a we have what five or six long rods yeah. on the side of our boat, and I just handed him the the seventeen foot, grabbed the next one, and dropped that down with a with a hair hey. jig on it, and they started biting. So we kept going with the pear jig until they stopped biting. Went and back we, to the plastic. Went back to the plastics and started biting. I mean, it's it just, it varied. They stopped biting, I'm going to say twice. Uh, stopped biting on the on the plastics, I'm guessing about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, and then once we got the hair jig, they, they stayed on the hair jig for a little while. And they stopped biting that about 11, 11.30. We went back to the to the plastics again. and they, and they started hitting it again and we just kept, kept pulling them in. You're very analytical about like, you know, at 9.43 a.m. on the dot is uh, when this bite stopped. Like what, what made uh, you, yeah. 
I don't watch the clock. I don't watch the clock when I'm up there. Uh, but we do have a clock on our on our forward on our forward facing sonar, the sonar, the HDS. We have a clock on there. I don't watch the clock, um, but I kind of know about what times. I keep a I keep a good running on the day because I want to know how long I have left. But uh, I struggle with this as an angler about when to make color changes, when to make bait changes. Like, why is it you, it sounded like you, you had a pretty good rhythm and tempo of like, okay, it's time to make the change. Like, is it, was it gut instinct or what were you seeing that made it so easy for you to make those quick adjustments? The, the main reason why we made the change is the one he was, he was using, it was a June bug with a monkey milk belly on it, just a two inch shad looking bait. And he had, Jack had caught probably five or six fish off of it, and it was getting mangled. And the color that we changed to was the closest one I had in my hand. So that's what warranted the color change then, just so I didn't have to dig through the bag to to grab the same color. And they liked the other color just as well. That's insane. That's I just I wish I had that confidence to be able to quickly change like that. I would probably be like waiting it out to see if they turn on. That's. I, it takes a lot of guts to do that. I feel like a lot of people struggle with making changes. They'll lock something in their hands and die with it. Well, that, when they, that, June bug and, that June bug and monkey milk, I'm little, I'm that's that's about one of my favorites right now. They they they're tearing it up everywhere we go. So, how much would you say that you went from more? natural colors to then you switch to a brighter color uh or would you vice versa or is it just subtle changes within a natural kind of color pattern that really made the difference just subtle changes i think the first change we did was uh we went from the june bug and monkey milk to a uh, like a silver silver and white silver, silver, and, silver and white silver hmm. and monkey milk color um the second change when we changed again we went to the hair jig i think we used uh, a blue and white a blue and white light blue and white joe's, joe's jig nick taylor yeah, nick taylor jig uh, we used that for a little while, switched up again, went back to the, the plastics and like I said, just, just kept, kept catching them as fast as we could. I think there's something to be said there where it's about just constantly switching and adjusting everything you're doing. It, it, do you have an issue with this that we do in bass where if you start catching them, people start coming in on you? And if so, like, how do you guys deal with that? Not really. No, I mean, when you have 11 or 12 boats that are all fishing the same tournament, you would think that we had, there was one boat in our tournament that I'm, I think he only caught four or five fish. He was in the and, same area. You know, he was within 75 yards of us most of the day. Wow. But it, it was one of those, you know, if one boat was coming towards us, you know, we, we just all, you know, danced around each other and nobody got real close and nobody had any issues with it. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's something that we it's can learn. It's pretty competitive in the club, but everybody, everybody we're we're in the club with, we we're, we're all great friends. Um, we have a blast when we're together. Uh, we could sit side by side and just catch fish all day if we if we wanted to, and, and it's great. And and you were asking if you know all the other boats around us bothered us earlier, or, you know, watching them and whatnot. He was heads down on the sonar. I was keeping an eye out. You know, I'd see a boat over here catch a fish, and I'd, you know, see. I'm like, all right, that's a pound, pound and a quarter fish. You know, I still think we're pretty good on what we have, you know, because I could see what other what other boats were catching. That is some angler maturity that I don't think a lot of people have in any discipline of fishing. I, I, I mean, Potomac River is a classic example. You stick a bass before you know it. It's the Jersey Turnpike. You got 50 people around you, and it's it wears on you when you're out there and you're grinding through a grass flat, everyone's catching them and you're not. And then you got the wheels turning in your head that you're a terrible person. You should just quit fishing. And and it just, it starts playing at you to be able to keep your head down and grind is important. And it's not about drama on the water. It's just from a, an athletic perspective. If people are catching them and you're not, that's really hard to keep those voices quiet in your head. Yeah. I don't have anything running through my head except that. <laughs> <my son. laughs> Literally, when I, when I'm on the when I'm on that sonar, my wife. We were talking to my wife uh, the other day. When I'm on that sonar, text messages come through, everything, and I don't hear anything. He doesn't just, hear his phone ding or anything. I'm focused on that. So that's that's like I said, that's my job up there <laughs> is just to keep on the fish. How hard is it with the screen size that you got to to tell the difference between you know a a 
plus pounder versus a dink. I mean, th- those fish that are pretty close together in size. I mean, granted, a massive one is is obvious to see. Uh, a lot of that's going to be in your settings as for how deep you have it set plus how far you have it shooting forward on it. So we don't maximize the entire screen with, you know, the bottom all the way at the bottom of the screen because then you can't push it out as far. Hmm. And, and get your any kind of quality on it. So our bottom will probably be about halfway up our screen a lot of times. That way we can shoot out to 50, 60 feet. You see some fish there. Normally the dots will look bigger the further they are away. And then once you get closer on them, sometimes they get the smaller, freak. but if they start to get bigger, you know you've got a decent fish. The uh, This tournament, the, the Chickahominy River tournament, all the fish in that area were were – roughly the same size on the forward facing center. Um wow. we just pre-fished uh Anna. Anna's our next tournament uh, right here in Tripp's backyard. And we pre-fished uh, quite a few spots last weekend and we caught some that were, you know, three quarter pound, half pound, something like that. And then we finally found where some of the fish were and you could still see the three quarter pound and pound size fish on the forward facing and then all of a sudden you'd have this huge dot and i'm like that's a nice fish so we ended up we ended up catching some nice ones last weekend hopefully that puts us in a good spot to maybe come back and talk with you again next month (laughs) i would love that um to have back-to-back champions do you have to do a lot of tackle changing when you go from relatively shallow tidal water to lake anna or is it No, not only the long rods, but, you know, say if we if we're side scanning and we see some fish on the dock, we have shorter rods right there, you know, within arm's reach. You know, that way we can shoot a dock, something like that. And normally we have our colors pretty much selected before we even get out there. So we're not Damn. doing much tying and rigging and everything once we get out there. That's the advantage of having having multiple rods and having multiple rods set up as we can have different colors on each one. Just grab an extra rod. I'm still taking it back that you already know what you're going to fish before you hit the water. Cause good Lord, I wish I had that kind of we try, man. We try. Well, that's on tournament day. And I say that because that means we were there the day before. Mm-hmm. So, and unless you get, you know, torrential rain, it's not going to change it that much overnight. <sighs> that is true. Yeah. It's just, it's just interesting to me. Like, their behaviors versus tidal versus a lake that you're going to. Cause I would assume that the chick versus Anna would fish a little bit differently. Um, and I'm no tired time of year is also a big factor in that. Um, but you mentioned, you know, I think you mentioned docks at Lake Anna and do you feel like they're going to be pushing up that close, uh, when your tournament, when is your next tournament? Is it late March or early March? Uh, March 16th. Okay. So it's okay. It's coming up here pretty sure two weeks from Saturday. Yeah. Okay. It should be warming up then by then to get them back up there. Do you think it's going to be, it's going to be pushing shallow or do you think they're going to still be deep? It depends on the weather. Can we plead the fifth on this one? Yeah. yeah you can plead the fifth on that one. That's no problem. It's just because you, you meant, <laughs> I, I think a lot of it depends on the weather. Cause you, you, you mentioned the, the long water. rods, you mentioned the long rods and I was just curious if they were deep, can you still use those long rods? Oh yeah. Oh, deep is easier than shallow with the longer rods. Really? Huh. Because you have to figure if you're if you're holding a 17 foot rod straight out and you're only in six foot of water, then when you're trying to bring the fish in, you've got to let line out to where you can get it back to the boat, or either the fish is going to be dangling 11 feet in the air above. Yeah. Okay. If it, if it fish is down 15 feet, you just got to bring the rod up, and the fish will be right there where the net is. Holy shit! I didn't even think of that. Okay, that makes way more sense. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Well, that, that blew my mind. That's interesting. Do you, do you have an issue with other bycatch then when you're doing this? Like how often do you guys stick other species w- while you're fishing? So when we were pre-fishing the Chickahominy, I think I caught three catfish and that was just hanging a minnow out the back. Um, you know, ended up with three cat and we didn't catch any yellow perch or any, no bass um, on the Chickahominy. It was, you know, all crappy in those three catfish. That's insane. Wow. Uh, when we were pre-fishing this past weekend, Jack, he caught a, probably about an 18 or a 20 inch striper. Hmm. Um, How? 
That's insane. On a, on a crappy jig That's on the long rod. Okay, you didn't snipe him or anything. It just was like yeah. on the long. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Well, we. I mean, steps. You know, sixteen, seventeen inch striper. It shows up on the forward facing about the same size as a you know a pound 15, and a half crappie, <laughs> a fifteen, sixteen inch crappie that we're shooting for. <laughs> Don't they act? And it's just curiosity. Like I've I've had um. I, we did a striper show on about Kerr Reservoir a couple months ago, and he talked about like the striper that it, they almost seem like tuna on the forward facing sonar because they just constantly move. Is that a yeah. is that a distinguishing factor between like the crappie? Because I'm assuming crappie stack up more, you know, vertically correct versus like largemouth wood. The the schooling ones do. The larger Roman fish, they're just swimming by themselves, or you might see two or three swimming together. They're not. Oh. They're not stacked on on any kind of structure or anything. That makes it way harder to tell what the heck you're looking at. Like, are you chasing actually the right thing? I didn't even think of that. Wow. You, you learn you learn by their movements on the sonar. And like if it's a catfish, a lot of times when it turns, you can see the V in the tail. Hmm. Or a bat, the you know, their movements are a whole lot different than a crappy. Yeah. They're a lot faster. That's insane. That's really crazy. So I mean, guys, I mean, that's that's freaking awesome. The Chickahominy win there um, again, guys, if you t 10 pounds, 88 ounces, what do you think Lake Anna will take to win? If you had to guess. 11, it's going to take 11. That's insane 11. that Lake Anna would have better weights. Wow. Last year, last year, I think Josh had, uh, had 1103. Rate. Yeah, 11 something. Uh, and jo Josh, Josh knows what he's doing when he's gets out on any body of water. He knows what he's doing. So. Uh, we just got to try to beat Josh. <laughs> He's going to love that. But the, the Chickahominy tournament, that's the closest weights we've had um, in the top four. Wow. So it's the first time we've had uh, multiple double-digit bags in a tournament. And then, again, guys, I'll just rattle this off uh, raw for you, and I'll, I'll put this – I'll put a link to this. As always, link to everything in the episode description. Uh, we had, let me try to make sure I do this in order because I'm dyslexic as hell. Uh, we got 1038, then we had 1040, 1046, and then 1088. That's, uh, and that, that's a maximum of seven fish total, which that's, that's, that's insane. That's really good weights. I mean, especially for this area, I know we're not in Missouri or places like that, that are these, these big meccas, but what would you consider uh, of the big ones, not little lakes on your tour right now? the best crappie lake right now uh, of the ones you're touring to this year. That's hard to say. Yeah. I think, I think they all can produce. They, yeah, all of them can produce double digit bags. Wow. Yeah. Um, it just depends on the time of the year that you get to, uh, different lakes and where uh, I, th I think Anna could, I think Anna could produce, you know, a good 12, maybe 12 <laughs> pound bag. But it, it it would be tough. Um, like Chesden, they they could produce a, a nice 10, 12 pound bag. Ch Chesden's one of those lakes where you're either going to get four pounds or ten pounds. Is that the lake that scares you the most on the schedule? What lake scares you the most on the schedule? Anna. Anna. Really? And it's in my backyard. It's in his backyard. Is it because of the yips? I don't think it's going to scare us quite this year. I think this year we might have a grasp on Anna finally also. It, is it because it's like it's the place you fish so much? It's like the, the home field curse, so to speak? Could be. Yeah. And then plus after, I don't, we normally don't fish here, never during the summer, never during the fall, uh, just because there's so many pleasure boaters out here. Yeah. So I don't, I'm sucks. not out here as much as I, I should. And then the wintertime month, um, I know it was frozen. Uh, there was some ice on the lake back in January, so we didn't get out here then. And this is the first, this past weekend was the first time we've been on Anna since October. Damn. Wow. Yeah. It, yeah. That's a whole thing about the psychology of just athletes about how some places just have your number, which makes no sense when you think it should just be another day at the office. But for some reason, it just has a monkey on your back. Um, and Lake Ann has done that to me in the past for sure, where it just, it's so weird. Every time I go down there, it sounds great in practice, but then the tournament comes and all hell breaks loose. I don't know why that place has my number like that, but it does. 
what is what is the biggest crappie that you guys have caught i've always asked everyone this uh their their prs uh, mine's a 196 mine is a 240 holy shit that's nice that's a big one yeah, it's it's insane how many I think that's where like the next state record is going to be broken. I think it's not going to be these bigger lakes. It's going to be some of these smaller off the wall places. That's probably where it's going to get cracked. And I really do think the state record crop is swimming around there now. We just someone's just got to go catch it. Uh, I know there was a 310 white crappie caught on Kerr last week. That's That's a big ass fish. Holy crap. And I'm not sure why, but there's not a state record listed for Virginia for white crappie. Really? All right, hold on. There is for black crappie, but not white crappie. You guys don't, if you guys are listening on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, I am actually just Googling it up for Virginia right now. Yeah, holy crap. There's two. Why is there two black crappie? That makes no sense. Well, I don't know with an asterisk. That makes no sense. Private pond. Uh, and then, like, I think it has something to do with the dates or something as for when one of them was caught compared to the other. I think it was a different regulation then. God, that is so weird. This is the other thing too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here it is. White crappie, no entry to date. Well, shit. Then that's an easy one to break. Uh, no entry to date. Minimum white crappie to qualify is three pounds. So there's no entry, but we're going to say it has to be over three pounds. Right. Okay. That makes Damn, that makes no sense. And I, I'm think Kerr's kind of in that gray area because a lot of it's in North Carolina, a lot of it's in Virginia. So even though both states have jurisdiction over it, does it count if you catch it on the North Carolina side, you know, side of the state line compared to in Virginia? Yeah, that is a weird one to me because if you launch your boat at Leesylvania and Potomac and drive to Mattawoman and you catch a 15 pound largemouth or a a massive snakehead and then you bring it back to Virginia. Like right. whose record would it actually be there? That is and, and curse is a weird ass lake. I mean, I've I, I know half my audience hates it and how it's managed, the other half loves it. it I don't know. That's so, that place is so squirrely. Like, would you guys prefer fishing Gaston or Kerr if you had your druthers between the two? Right now. Right now, gas Gaston because we have a lot of waypoint safe. <laughs> Do they fish the same? Are they both on the uptick, the downtrend? Like, where would you put them? We've only fished Kerr one time, and that was just for uh, – we went down there to, to, to actually watch Josh and Jeff uh, weigh in at the Bobcats tournament. And we, we just went down there just fishing. Fun fish, for but fishing. just to see where we would stack up. Mm-hmm. Fishing the Bobcats tournament, which didn't stack up very well that day. No. That's – yeah, That that's – I, I hats off to you guys. I really wish I had that kind of talent with the forward facing sonar and to be able to get on them like this. Um, y- you mentioned waypoints. This is really the last that thought I had is like compared to bass fishing where you have like a Brian thrift that he's hitting, you know, 200 docks in a day in practice. How many spots or areas do you want to feel comfortable? Do you want two, a thousand? Like when do you feel pretty comfortable going into a tournament? For our Gaston tournament, our Gaston tournament was in October. We did the, it, it's kind of our fall classic, basically. Um, and we did Gaston the year year prior, and we did Gaston last year. Um, just, I, I, when we went into Gaston this past year, I like to have at least three or four spots that I know fish are at. Okay. And we can try to work through them. Uh, wish we could have found bigger fish, but uh, that place is so big, just like, her, it's huge and the waypoints that we save uh, they're you know trees underwater that you can't see or, or brush piles and a lot of people will just pass them by not thinking that anything's there just do a lot of side scanning to find them how often are largemouth mixed in with crappie mm, occasionally yeah it, occasionally Especially if you're shooting docks. If you're shooting docks, you, you'll you'll find some largemouth under there. Um, do you do you generally see it as a, a seasonal thing when you see largemouth mixed in with them? Uh, I hadn't really paid attention. I'd probably say we catch more of them in the spring, in the, in the spring and summer. Spring and fall. The, the reason I, I asked that is I've always had this hypothesis about when you talk about using white for for largemouth baits, and everyone says it's shad. But I always believe like it's not just shad, it's crappie. 
that that right. that white and black flake because you know crappie i believe spawn first and then largemouth spawn and i think it's interesting right. that they also cohabitate a lot of the same areas and i've caught so many largemouth on a white and black bait in lakes that do not have shad and i never understood it for the longest time <laughs> so that's my hypothesis anyway that's interesting sounds good to me the last last thing last thing i, I know guys i keep you way too long here but my last thing is you, you talk about hunting one fish how does that technique work? I mean, do you just put the trolling motor on a hundred and just run after him or the, when, when we're, when we're chasing a fish, when like, uh, we find one that, that looked bigger than, um, the other docks that the, were the rest of them. It, I mean, you really can't chase them when around docks. If, if you find the open water fish, you find one that, that looks better. Basically, I just, I, I get the foot pedal on the trolling motor and, and start working it and, make it to where i try to stay with that fish if it's swimming um most of the time crappy are pretty stationary i mean there was a couple last weekend that we chased around for 50 60 yards and, and one of them we finally caught the other one didn't even like the bait so it, are, it just varies are you trying to keep a certain distance i'm like i'm assuming uh, what do you have a shot out to like 60 feet? So are you trying to keep him right at the edge of 60 feet? Cause I'm assuming you don't want to be like within 10 feet of him, right? No, that that's when we, the 60 foot, that's where we're getting the first look at him. And we sneak up on him to where your bait is just dropping straight down from the tip of your rod. You're not okay. having to cast out or, or pitch to him or anything. Okay. We're just dropping straight down on him. Hmm. And if, if you're chasing a moving fish, are you just constantly trying to put the bait in front of him or are you waiting for him to set up before you execute and put that bait in front of him? I'm trying, I'm trying to wait for him to slow down. Once I, once I get caught up with him, I'll either put the bait down just before and kind of let it swim over top of him slowly. Uh, if he stops, uh, that's a problem because we don't have the crappy brakes that you were talking about earlier. So we can't really stop automatically. Um, yet. Ooh. So, but you I mean there we're it, it's it can be difficult to keep up with them, and then if they stop and we keep going, it just it doesn't work too well that way. Uh, so I try to keep it at a safe distance to where if I see on the forwards so facing that he's slowed down or 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 started to stop, then I'll just let off the trolling motor and and hopefully we can guide up to him with and just just let it float right over. Him. So. How long will you give a fish before you give up on him and then move on? Did you the ones on the front? I usually try to give them maybe a minute or so. Um, if 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 I can get it right above him and I see movement, that usually lets me know, hey, you know, he might be interested. Um, hmm. Once they tilt up and look at it, uh, it, sometimes they'll look at it for thirty seconds, or it, it seems like five minutes, but it's only like thirty seconds. Um, and it's, you'll, you can tell he'll, he'll just, he'll just nose back down and then swim away. Uh, but yeah, once they, once they swim away, I'll leave them alone. Uh, might go try to find another fish for a little while. And then if I know it's a nice one, I mean, I'll go back in the area and try to find him again. So generally speaking, and maybe this is just a biology difference between a large mouth or any bass and a crappie. If it's on a, a a tree or something like that, a, a piece of cover, generally speaking, you can come back if no one else has caught him and he'll be there. So it's just more of like waiting for him to reposition and reset up. Yeah. Right. If a fish is just hovering in the ether, is that more catchable or less catchable compared to a fish that's actually set up on a piece of structure? Mm, that's a tough question. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes the, the, the fish that are suspended, they're, they're just waiting for a bait to swim by. And oh. usually, like I said, they'll they'll nose up and, and snatch it in a heartbeat. Then you have some that that don't even look twice at it, or they go straight down and then they just disappear on the bottom because they're they're just hugging the bottom. I think if if you're if you're fishing some type of brush pile or or a stump or something like that, a lot of times there are multiple fish in, in there, and if you drop your bait down, one of them might not look at it, but one of them might come up and look at it. And next thing you know, the, the other one's coming up and, you know, it, if you have multiple, sometimes it, it causes them to, you know, say, hey, who's going to eat the bait first. And it, it actually, it's actually good, but you just got to find the right fish to, 
right size fish to catch for a tournament uh, in a brush pile like that. And it, it, they're not really, the big tournament fish are, are not really brush pile fish. Uh, most of them that we find are just open water roaming. That's so cool because that's like what's happening with bass tournaments right now. If you look at the top, uh, you know, the top leaders at the uh, the Toledo Bend tournament, a lot of them is just catching individual fish, and that's a talent. I, I think it's if you're just going after individual fish, crappie or bass, you got to have a lot of confidence in your ability with technology to go out there and be like, "I'm hunting. We'll find five or we'll find seven. And, and I think a lot of the old school people that complain about it, they're just not comfortable just saying like, "I don't have a bunch of." I have areas, but I don't have, I'm going to hit six docks. It's just an area and I'm going to go hunt for it, which is, it's a talent. It really is. Mm, I, I like to stay up on the technology. So <laughs> I, I, we watch YouTube videos all the time, just live scope videos, just to watch how the fish react to, to other people's jigs dropping down to them and stuff. It's something you have to learn. So um, it, it really is. And I definitely learned a lot from, from, from you all. I mean, again, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Is there any sponsors or shout outs that you'd like to give? Uh, sure. I'll, yeah, let me read, <laughs> read your shirt. We were talking about that earlier. I'd have to read the shirt. We got, uh, the guy that I work with, uh, work for my boss, uh, ace class. Uh, they do, they let me off on, on some days to where I can go fish, pre fish and stuff like that. Uh, buddy of mine, he owns the Craven electrical. Uh, right down the road, uh, so he he sponsored us this year. Uh, we have a few different jigs, a oh. bunch, actually a bunch of different jig companies. Uh, the first one is the Crappy Nut Jig. Uh, it's a guy out of uh, Missouri, Glenn out of Missouri, Missouri, and he makes some awesome plastics. Uh, we have Lake Country Baits down uh, Dennis on Lake Gaston. He hand pours all of his. He's got probably one of the best small profile baits I've ever seen. Oh, cool. Um, He's got one that's called the Tweety Bird. One of them's called the Tadpole Junior. And they're maybe an inch and a quarter long, and they're they're just really good, real small profile baits. We have uh, Silent Assassin. They are, they make plastic. He's making plastics also, one of the guys at the club. Uh, he started his own thing, making making little plastic baits. Then we have uh, Trippy Sticks Jigs. Trippy Sticks Jigs, TJ Tucker. Nick Taylor Jigs. Nick Taylor Jigs is Joe Malone. What is it? Mione. Mione. Uh, he's in the club also. And we have uh, Freddie with Karaki Coffin jigs also. So we got an assortment of baits to go through. Not everybody's number gets called during the tournament. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, that would make it make it hard to, you know, spread the love that thin when you've got something that's working for you that day. You know, you don't want to change it up just to make everybody happy. I really need to start having some of these local. I, I try to have as many local bait makers on as possible, and I really need to diversify into the crappie uh, crappie world as well. So, if there's any local crappie bait makers that would like to come on the show and tell your story, I'd be more than happy to to hear from you because that's a that's a fun thing to uh, to kind of bring light to as well. Uh, and we then got, we got a bunch of them in the club, so they. Uh, I'm sure they'll. Come on, if you want them to. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, basically, I don't need to sleep, and I pretty much record every night to begin with. So <laughs> let's keep keep the good times rolling. Um, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. I'm going to link everything up to the club, to all the sponsors, um, and any other links that they would like to put in there as well. Please like and subscribe to the channel; it really helps out uh, with the algorithm. And also try to check out our Patreon. We're only six people away from hitting our overall goal of 100 Patreon subscribers, so we can keep this show going through 2024 and beyond. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.